you stand with me for the reading of God's Word, 18th chapter of Luke, and beginning today in verse 18. And a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And he said, all these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he was very sad for he was extremely rich. Father, we thank you for this reading of your word. We ask that you will bless it. Thank you for providing us with such a treasure as we attempt to understand it better this morning. We ask that you will open the eyes of our understanding, the eyes of our enlightenment. Father, we pray as Paul did that you will teach us you will teach us the power and the wonder of the indwelling Holy Spirit, that you will help us to understand the love of Jesus that has been expressed for us, and that you would help us to respond to the message of the gospel. Help us, Lord, help it to be ever new to us, ever inspiring, ever at the root of our life, at the foundation of the things that we do. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being here. We pray for those who do not have that privilege, those who are persecuted in hard places, standing for your word. We ask that you will give them grace. We pray that they will know of the prayers of others. We pray that they will stand firm for the truth. And we ask that you will be glorified in whatever sacrifice it is that you're calling them to make. We pray that we will be equally faithful whenever you call us to make whatever sacrifice it is that you call on us to make. We thank you this morning, Father, for those who have served in our military, and we pray that you will protect them as they find themselves in harm's way. We thank you for the many freedoms that we have because of the lives that have been given over the years. And Lord, we pray for our government, for our rulers, those who are leaders. You've asked us to do that. As we come up to this time of election, Lord, the, the, um, the conditions, the, I suppose the, uh, the end result has never been more, um, Lord, more important than it is now. And we pray that you will cause those who are elected to be ones that you're of your choosing. We pray that they will rule with an eye toward the law of God, toward the character of God. We long for this on behalf of our nation and, Lord, the light that it has been in the world for so long. Now we pray, turn our attention toward you, help us to Remove the distractions from our minds that would keep us from hearing what it is you have to say. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, and please do turn with me to Luke 18 if you're not already there. It's a wonderful passage of Scripture, difficult passage of Scripture, really, in a way. It teaches us about good intentions, right? It's like the like the middle-aged man that was walking by the uh, pond that had frozen over, you know, and he, and he heard, heard a little boy shouting and hollering, and he saw there he was. He had fallen through a hole in the ice. And so he went over to pull him out and help him out, and he, and he helped him out, and when he got all done, he said, how did, how did you come to fall in? He said, I didn't come to fall in. I came to skate and uh, accidentally fell in. Well, that illustrates that good intentions don't always keep disaster from striking, right? Neither does it in this passage of Scripture. 
Supposedly, I think it was St. Bernard of Clairvaux who said, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Good intentions are not enough. Now, Jesus has just said in this passage in verse 17, as we looked at it last week, he said, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And Luke follows that immediately with a, an account of a man who looked like an absolute cinch to get in. In his day and in his time, anyone who saw him or knew him would have thought, surely if anyone is in, it is him. Most of us have friends like that, somewhere along the line. Neighbors, people that we love and that we care about, that we would say, surely they are in. But this man was not in. And he did not make it. Luke calls him a young ruler. In Matthew's parallel account, Matthew 19, he calls him rich, so he's become known to history as the rich young ruler, an appropriate designation of him. He asked the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You may recall we found a lawyer, someone who was well-versed in the law of Moses that came and asked Jesus that question a few chapters ago, but he came asking that question to trick Jesus, not this man. He is absolutely sincere in his question. He is honest in his intentions. His intentions are good. He wants to know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And you know what? He does a lot of things right. Does a lot of things right, doesn't he? You know, first of all, he, he recognizes that he has a need. He's a good man. He's going to assure us of that. He's going to really prove it in a sense. But he's not sure if he's good enough. Sees the need. He not only sees the need, but he does something about it. He, he seeks help. He comes. Um, Mark's account, Mark 10, tells us that he, he came running up and he cast himself at the feet of Jesus, something that would have been in that society particularly undignified would have shown his humility in coming to Christ. He comes to the right place. He comes to Jesus. He does a lot of things right. And Mark tells us, makes a special point of it, that Jesus loved him. That shouldn't be a surprise to any of us. Jesus loves everybody, right? And Jesus surely followed his own commands to love his neighbors, to love his enemies as we See later on when he died on the cross. But in a particular way, he apparently had a natural affection for this man that reached out to him that wanted so badly for him to understand. I don't think you could probably find anyone in history that had a better opportunity than this man. Good intentions are everywhere in this account. And yet he goes away in one of the saddest conclusions in the Bible. He goes away empty. He goes away without eternal life. He goes away as lost in leaving as he was when he came. How could that happen? How could he have so many things that fall into place that are just right and yet miss eternal life? And you know, while you're thinking about that, because we'll look at three things here that I think cause that, keep in mind, beloved, every one of us who sits here this morning is one of the most privileged persons in history. We are sitting in one of, the, one of the greatest countries in the world that history has ever known. We have more privilege here than anyone in history has ever had. We have the, we have the Word of God in how many translations in English that we can read any of them. We have them in our houses. We come to a church, at least here, that preaches the gospel, and I hope that's where you've been and will be in the future. We have advantages. The question is, are our intentions, our good intentions going to get it done? Not if it doesn't change our heart. So what did he get wrong? Three things. Number one, he got Jesus wrong. He thought he was good, not God. He thought he was good, not God. This is his most tragic mistake of all, of course. You can't get Jesus wrong and still get to heaven. If you haven't figured it out now, if you don't understand this, the New Testament com 
constantly, inextricably links God the Father with God the Son, with Jesus Christ, and makes the point time after time, in way after way, you cannot come to the Father except through the Son. You cannot ignore Jesus. You cannot call him only good and get to heaven. You cannot do it. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And this man didn't get that. Now, he didn't miss by much. That's one of the things that makes this whole thing so tragic. He didn't miss by much. You don't exactly see it until you realize the, the, the character of the times. Look at it in verse 18. He says, a ruler came to him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That address, good teacher, to us just sounds like good manners, right? Just kind of buttering him up or just recognizing you're a good man. But what, what we don't realize that people in Jesus' time would have realized is nobody ever called anybody good teacher. It wasn't done. In all of the rabbinic literature, there's never an account where somebody called one of the rabbis good teacher. Why? Because as good as they were, they did not consider them worthy of that kind of title. The rabbis taught there is nothing good except the law. And they believed that. It's not that there weren't people who didn't think that they were good. The Pharisees, as we know, as we've seen time after time, thought that they were at least good enough, but they didn't go around calling each other good. To outright call someone good, as this young man calls Jesus, was to, uh, uh, was to address him with a reverence that was completely extraordinary. This man undoubtedly had Jesus on a pedestal he was good himself, but he thought Jesus was better. He looked up to him, and he comes to him for help. Jesus was the greatest and best man that he had ever seen, such that he would even bow the knee to him, according to Mark. But he was thinking only in moral terms. He was one step short of where you have to be. And Jesus does everything that he can to get him that one step further. He doesn't quite get there. Look at verse 19. Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. That's a fascinating statement, isn't it? It's been misinterpreted, misunderstood many times down through history. People have said, see, Jesus didn't even think he himself was sinless. He said only God was good. But that's not what he's saying, right? We know better than that. The Bible tells us in the New Testament time after time, Jesus was without sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he was without sin. In passages like 1 John 3.5, he was without sin. 1 Peter 2.2, 2, he was without sin. The writer to the Hebrews, we don't know for sure who he was. In chapter, two, verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 15, he was without sin. All the people and the men who knew Jesus and lived with him for years later testified to the fact that he was without sin. He was sinlessly perfect. He had to be sinlessly perfect. To be the Lamb of God, to take away the sin of the world, he had to be himself without sin. There's no question that Jesus was without sin as presented in the Bible and according to the character that the people who were around him all the time saw. So what is the point? Here's what it is, beloved. Declaring no one is good except God, that Jesus was trying to get that man to consider the ramifications of what he said himself when he called Jesus good. If Jesus is good and only God is ultimately good, then what does that say about Jesus? Jesus is God. That's what Jesus wants him to see. He's trying to get him to understand the ramifications of his own comment think about what you've said something else is going on here Jesus is giving him an under, and, and inviting him to consider that when he talks about goodness he has much too low a view of what goodness is he's thinking of goodness in 
moral terms and in relative terms, relative to those of others around him. And so he thinks of himself as being good, but he's missed the fact, fatal mistake, not to realize that goodness will ultimately be judged not by some run-of-the-mill human standard, but by the standard of the character of God, who is called in Hebrews 12, 29, a consuming fire of holiness. That's the standard. That's why only God is good. This man is about to declare himself good. But compared to the consuming goodness of God, he is just like all the rest of us, condemned in our lostness without hope. That's what Jesus is trying to get him to realize. But the real issue here is really simple. It's the same one that Luke has introduced time after time in his gospel. Who is Jesus? That's the question. And by the comment that he's made, Jesus made, Jesus is urging him, is, is saying to him, you know, think, man, think what you're saying. If you think I am ultimately good and only God is ultimately good, then think about who does that say that I am and what am I here for? Think. Christianity isn't just about exercising faith and putting your mind on the shelf, beloved. Think. Who am I? Why have I come? In the end, it's to no avail. Because this man just sees Jesus as morally a good person, but not as God. How many times have you heard people say, yeah, Jesus is the best man I think that ever lived, or Jesus was a good man and a great prophet, or whatever else, all wonderful statements, way too low. We must understand who Jesus really is. Failure to bow to Jesus as God is fatal. Eternally fatal. That's what Jesus is trying to get him to see. If you don't know who Jesus is, you'll never get why he came. This, this guy thought that Jesus was morally you know, superior. He thought he came to help him be better. He didn't come to help him be better. He came to save him. He didn't come to help him be good. He came to save him because he wasn't ultimately good. As good as he was outwardly. He would have known that if we would have realized that he was standing face to face with God. Can you imagine? Standing face to face with God in the flesh. I think his whole response would have been different, don't you? I think it would have been totally different. He didn't get that. He didn't get Jesus. President Reagan, in his final address to the nation in 1989, as he was leaving office, he gave an illustration, true story from the 1980s, uh, that came from the uh, boat people, people who were fleeing for their lives, mostly from Vietnam, but from all over Indochina. You remember, some of you who lived through that, how they would be out on the seas in these rickety, help hopelessly decrepit boats hoping somebody would find them and pick them up and they could be found to safety. Many of those people found their way to the neighborhood close to where we lived in Southern California at that time, so much so that eventually the whole tenor of the neighborhood changed. In fact, signs went up on, on some of the main streets in town that had been pretty much upper class middle neighborhoods and they were just oriental signs all over the place. First time I ever went to China, I called Patty and she said, well, what's it like over there? I said, it looks like home. And, I, and honestly, it did, because the signs in Chinese looked like the signs I could drive by every day in my car by the time this was all over. But can you imagine what would cause people to do this? Well, the carrier Midway was out there in Reagan's story, and one of the sailors spotted one of these rickety, you know, uh, craft out there on the ocean, bobbing up and down. And so the carrier went over to pick these people up. They sent a launch out to pick them up. And as the refugees were coming on that launch toward this big, impressive ship, the Midway, one of them stood up and he called out to one of the sailors. He said, hey, American sailor, hey, freedom man. That's what he represented to him. 
Beloved, that's who Jesus is. Jesus is not a good man to raise you up by your moral standards. Jesus is a savior, the God-man who came to save you from your sins. That's who Jesus is. Until you get that straight, there's just no hope because this is God's plan you're turning down. This is Jesus to every sinner. He's not a moralist. He's a savior. Secondly, this man got the question wrong. Now, the question he asked is a good question, but it's the wrong question. It should have probably been framed a little differently. It's only wrong because of what he meant by it. What did he say? He said, what must I do to be saved? And he literally meant that. What must I do? do to be saved. It's the, it's, it's the wrong question because it, it assumes that eternal life is a matter of doing something or doing enough somethings, being good enough to get in on my own. Better he should have asked, how can I get eternal life or something like that? But he, he asked the question, what must I do? And Jesus does an interesting thing because this is what Jesus usually does in a case like this, or at least often he does. I, at least I have found in my study, Jesus goes along with his assumption. He often spends time trying to show people the fallacy of their assumption. And so he says, oh, you want to do? Well, okay, you know the commandments, verse 20. Do not commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't bear false witness, honor your father and mother. How's that going for you? Are you keeping the law? And this guy was absolutely ready for this question. I think, I think he was hoping he would get this question. Because what did he do? He turned around, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah let me assure you. I have, I have done or not done, as the case may be, all of those things. Every one of the ones you mentioned, I'm absolutely clean. I'm not sure that all of us could say that this morning, but he could say that. I've got my act together, Jesus. Impressive. Some people fault him and say, well, he, was, you know, he, he must have been a hypocrite because nobody could be that good. But, you know, the ones that Jesus mentioned, I think he really meant it, don't you? I, I think he was being honest. I think he was right when he said, I have kept those from my youth. He had done all of these outwardly. Of course, he had way too tolerant a view of sin. He'd forgotten. God doesn't just look on the outward, but God looks on the heart, which was the point Jesus made Matthew in Matthew 5 when he listed a bunch of these and said, oh, by the way, you've murdered if you had harbored, harbored bitterness in your heart against somebody. By the way, you've committed adultery if you've last, lusted after somebody in your heart. By the way, your heart is where this all happens. That's where the action is. The outward only shows what was in your heart, and sometimes your, your outward just hasn't caught up with your heart. That's all. Jesus knew that. Jesus said it in Matthew 5. But I think it's interesting. He didn't go there in this case. He didn't go there. He could have argued that point, but he doesn't. He just goes on further and he says this. Okay, let's assume that you really haven't done all these things, that you've been as good as you think you've been, that you have kept all these commandments. But you're still here for some reason, right? You're feeling lost, you wouldn't be here if you didn't have some doubt. You wouldn't be here if you really had assurance that you have eternal life. So let's assume that you've done all of this, but you think there's still something else. And guess what? There is. Let me tell you what it is. And then he lowers the boom. This has been a good conversation up to this point, right? One thing you still lack. Sell all that you have distribute it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and then come and follow me. See, what Jesus is saying in essence is there's one, there's one commandment we haven't talked about here. Number 10. The one that says you shall not covet. And here's your test. I want you to sell everything you have and I want you to go distribute it to the poor. This is your test on that commandment. If you want to be saved by doing, this is what's required. Dead silence. No response. There's no arguing. There's no putting up a fuss. There's no theological discussion. 
there's just dead silence. And then in verse 23, but when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. You want to be saved by doing? Then do. Jesus knew he couldn't do it. He knew he couldn't do it. And that's exactly where Jesus wanted him to be. Jesus is basically saying, you want to be saved by doing? Then this is what's the requirement. I know you can't do it. You know you can't do it. So what's the alternative? Cast yourself on the mercy of God. You must seek forgiveness. You are not nearly as righteous as you think you are. You can't begin to compete with the righteousness of God, and that's what you're doing. So let me tell you how God would act. He would give up everything so that he could distribute to the poor, which is you and which is what I will be doing on behalf of God very shortly here. That's the righteousness that you have to do if you want to be saved by doing. Man couldn't go there any more than any of us could go there. But you see, Jesus isn't asking him to go there. Jesus is asking him, trust me to be your Savior. Do you think, you know, I, I've, I've unthought about this. Do you think that guy went away thinking that he wasn't saved? Do you think he went away thinking he didn't have eternal life? You know, kinda, you could kind of read this and think, well, okay, he just, he just rejected Christ so he knows he doesn't have eternal life. I don't think he did. I think he believed that he knew better than Jesus. I think he believed that his goodness was good enough and he was going to make it. I think he missed everything that Jesus was trying to point out to him. And he went away thinking that he was okay. But he wasn't. He set himself up as the judge and jury and he got it wrong. He went away heartbroken, but he didn't go repentant. He was so close. Our pastor, Philip DeCourcy, before we left Southern California, used to tell this story about a, his pastor. He came from Northern Ireland. <laughs> he spoke with a heavy Irish accent. It took several Sundays to figure out what in the world he was saying, you know, when he talked about faith and stuff like that, which is faith, once you get the interpretation. But... He, would, he talked about the pastor that he used to have there who told, about, who told about a guy that had been in his congregation one time. He went away to sea, military. And his family missed him desperately, and he missed his family desperately. So on the day that he came back after his first trip away, this boat, this large boat, got close enough to the dock that he decided he was just going to, he was going to, couldn't wait to get home. He jumped off the ship because he was going to, land on the dock and go home. But just as he jumped, the ship, the wave hit the ship and it took a little, a little movement backward. And so he didn't quite get to the dock. He got just close enough that he could grab it with his hands. And he grabbed on, but just then another wave pushed the ship into him and it just crushed him against the dock. Killed him. So they picked up his body, they covered it, they took it to his mother who wasn't that far away. Of course, she... She began to cry as she saw what had happened to her son, and as they explained it to her, she said, oh, so near and so far. So near and yet so far. That's what this young man is. He's so near and yet he's so far. Why? Because he got the person of Christ wrong and he got the question wrong. It's where moralism always leads, beloved. Anyone trying to be good enough for God is doomed by the very character of God itself. The gospel is not good, new, good works, it's good news. It's the good news that Jesus has taken our place, that he's died in our place. Somebody asked Luther one time, Martin Luther, they said, what, what's our contribution to salvation? Surely there's something. And he said, yeah, sin and resistance. That's our contribution. Sin and resistance in our best efforts. There is sin and resistance until we come in humility Bow before Christ and say, I cannot do this. Thank you for doing it for me. You got the question wrong. Thirdly, you got the answer wrong. 
all the good intentions in the world, but he got Jesus wrong, he got the question wrong, and finally he got the answer wrong. He followed his idol, not Christ. He followed his idol, not Christ. You know, Jesus told him, okay, I want you to go sell everything you have and distribute to the poor and then come and follow me. I, you know, I wonder this morning, if Jesus asked you that, I mean, let's just, before we delve into this, what would your answer be? You realize the answer that you could honestly, from the depths of your heart, give to that question tells a lot about whether you're really a Christian or not? Whether you're genuinely saved or just a professor instead of a possessor? So with that in the back of your mind, what is Jesus doing here? What's going on? I mean, is he really suggesting, what you, you know, what you really need to, you need to be poor. Poverty is the key to eternal life. Is that what Jesus is teaching? I don't think so. Money, you know, the, the, the lack of it or the bounty of it is not the issue. There were people in the Bible, King David was a rich man and he was... He was saved. Abraham was a rich man. He was saved. Joseph of Arimathea was a rich man, and he was a follower of Christ, secret one for a while. Interestingly enough, until Jesus was dead. If you want to know why, come in a few weeks, and we'll talk about that. But he was, he was, a, he was, a, he was a follower of Christ, though he was a rich man. We're going to see in, in, a, in, a just, you know, in the next chapter, in Luke 19, Zacchaeus, you know, the wee little... You've sang about him, right? Zacchaeus was a little, wee little man. Zacchaeus, he climbed up in the sycamore tree, right? For the Lord he wanted to see. You know the rest of the psalm. But anyway, that's Zacchaeus. But you remember Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus says, okay, I, I, I tell you what, Jesus, I, you know, I, I have been dishonest. I mean, he's confessing his sin. He said, I'm gonna, everything I've taken I will give back with interest and I, up to half of, my, half of my goods I will give to the poor. And what did Jesus say? That's not enough. You got to give it all. Is that what Jesus said? It's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, I tell you, today salvation has come to this house. Well, how come he got it for half and the other guy had to pay everything? This has never been money, beloved. Jesus does not routinely tell people, get rid of all your money. So why with this young man? Because it was a test. It was a hard test. It was a test intended to, it was a test intended to reveal his heart. See, his problem wasn't money. His problem was the love of money. And Jesus knew that. Jesus knew that. So he hits him right where he is, just like Jesus is prone to do with us. Just like he has the right to do with us. Jesus knew his problem. And he desperately wanted to see this man come to faith. But he knew his money was keeping him from it. Money was his love. Money was what he lived for. Money was what he got up in the morning and thought about. Money was what he thought about the rest of the day. Money was what he put his confidence in and his security in. Money was everything to him. He went away unhappy and heartbroken because he was extremely rich. Money, 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 the love of money was what his problem was. He wanted his money you know, he wanted Jesus as a safety net over here. That's what he really wanted, just in case. But he sure wasn't going to give up his money. Money was his idol, right? Money was his idol. He was trying to have Jesus and money too, two gods for the price of one, and it won't work. It didn't work for him. It won't ever work. You can't have another God and Jesus too. It's been the message of the Bible all the way through. Remember in 1 First, First Kings 18 when the Israelites had gone into the land of Canaan and they did great for a while and then they began to worship the gods of the surrounding neighbors, right? And one of those gods was named Baal, B-A-A-L. He was, he was an evil god in the minds of the people anyway. And the children of Israel started to worship him. Now, they, if you read carefully, you'll find out they were holding on to Jehovah with one hand, kind of, but then they, they really, you know, what they really did was get with these other gods. Baal, Ashtaroth, there were a bunch of them in Canaan. But this one is the one at the time, and Elijah, the prophet, the great prophet, says, let's have a contest. Let's find out who's really God. 
We'll have a contest. We'll, we'll, we'll make, a, we'll make a, an altar here. We'll put a sacrifice on the altar. And then you pray to Baal. You, you prophets of Baal, 400 of them. There's 400 of you. There's one of me. I mean, by any stretch of the imagination, you guys ought to win this. You pray to your God, and I'll pray to God. We'll see who gives fire from heaven. You remember the story? The prophets of Baal began to pray. Nothing happened. No fire. So they began to scream louder. And then they began to cut themselves. And, you know, they did all these things to get Baal's attention. And Elijah's sitting over on the side. You have to love Elijah. You know, he's sitting over on the side. Why scream a little louder? Maybe he's on vacation. Maybe he's going to the bathroom. He really said that, you know. If it was today, he'd say, maybe he's watching TV. You know, scream a little louder. You got to get his attention. That's a lot of faith, you know what? No fire. So they get all done, and Elijah says, okay, why don't you know, just pour water all over this thing. Make a ditch, fill it with water. And then in, he, he prays two small verses. You can, I'm not turning you there, but you can turn, 1 Kings 18, two little verses of prayer. And here comes fire in heaven, wiping out the altar, wiping out the sacrifice, wiping out the water. And then Elijah says this, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? You people are trying to have it both ways. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. You got to choose. Non-choosing is choosing anyway. It's choosing whatever is the idol in your life. Every one of us, every single one of us gets up every morning and lives for something. We all do. There's something that if you took, away, took it away from us, our life wouldn't be worth living. Every one of us. None of us is different. This is human. And whatever that thing is that you absolutely can't live without, whatever that thing is, and you know, I, I, to be honest, I've had, you know, I've had a lot of idols in my life. Have you? I've had sports as my idol at some point in time. I've had, I've had other things as my idols. Relationships as my idol. The idols can be allotted. They don't have to be Baal. But at some point we have to choose. Is it Baal or is it God? Can't have it both ways. Jesus said the same thing. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, what did he say? No one can serve two masters, for either will hate the one and love the other, or will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and money. Jesus is saying to this young man, for your sake, this isn't for me. It's not even for the poor. I have plenty of ways to feed the poor, although I'd love you to be part of the plan, but, but this is for your sake. Give up your money and now come and follow me. It's for your sake that I want this for you. It's because I love you that I want this for you. This is the heart of Jesus, beloved. It's a heart of compassion. It's not a heart of harshness. It's not a heart of trying to nail people to the wall. It's not a heart that wants people. You know, it's a heart that realizes the only the only thing worth having in life is Jesus above all else. You say, well, what about the other things? Great, have them, but they got to be second to Jesus. They can't be up here on this equal plane where we put them or even above Jesus. It must be Jesus. Or we have an idol. The tragic outcome here, Mark 10, 21, 22, disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. He went away. You know, the question always comes up, would Jesus really have made him do that? Would he really have made him sell everything, give it to the poor? You know what? It doesn't matter. The point is he needed to be willing to do that, and he wasn't. The other question is irrelevant. Jesus, God in the flesh, Ask him to do something. And he said, no. You can't do that and claim that you've got eternal life. Jesus, as somebody has said, must be Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And see, that's the, that's the provision of salvation. But if, if we confess Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. 
That's what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is ultimately showing this man is, look, I know you think you're good. I know you think you're great. And I know by outward standards you are. I don't even deny that. But let me tell you something. You're not even willing to obey the 10th commandment. You shall not covet. But I'll tell you something worse. You're not even obeying the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. You're not nearly as good as you think. None of us is nearly as good as we think. That's why we need a Savior. That's why Jesus came, to seek and to save those who are lost. As, I, as usual, the idol destroyed him. Idols always look good. Doesn't matter what your idol is, whether it's ambition or career or person or, you know, whatever it is, your goodness, your ministry, it could be anything. Idols always kill. This guy shortchanged himself. You say, well, psh, he still had all that money. It's true, he did. As far as we know, didn't he get to enjoy it? As far as we know, he did. But look what he missed. It's hidden away there kind of in verse 22. Look what he missed. Verse 22, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. It's either treasure here or treasure in heaven. What he missed was treasure in heaven. So I don't know how long he lived after this. Now, remember, this is not a parable, folks. This is a real person. See, this is a living, breathing, lively person who went through this experience. Given the benefit of the doubt, he's young and he's rich. So he's in his 20s and he's going to live for another 40 or 50 years. So he enjoyed his money for the next 40 or 50 years. Where is he now? 2,000 years later. See, he's somewhere. All of us have an eternal existence, right? And he's been the last 2,000 years of existence apart from the presence of God outside of heaven with nothing. He gave up forever to get now. He got the wrong answer. So what are your good intentions this morning? I don't know what they are. Here's what I know. The question is, do you have Jesus? Do you have Jesus? Is Jesus the King of Kings in your life? Is Jesus the Lord of Lords in your life? Jesus has given his life for you. Jesus has paid the price for your sins. Do you have Jesus? Have you confessed him as your Lord and Savior? Let me close with this modern version of this story. Derek Thomas is a pastor and commentator, writer, uh, teaches seminary, and I think pastors a church now. It's either in Jackson, Mississippi, or Columbia, South, Dakota, South Carolina. I'm not sure which place he is at the moment. But he tells a story when he was going through university in England. He's an English guy. He was going through University of England. He met a young lady there. She, she became attracted to the lives and the witness of some of the Christians who were there, including Derek Thomas. And because of that, she eventually began to ex investigate and examine the claims of Christ. She came to a recognition that this person was real. She began to believe that he must have died, and she began to believe that the evidence for his resurrection was greater than the evidence that he was not resurrected. She came to faith in Christ. She put her faith in Christ. She knew she had a problem. She recognized the problem. She came to the right place, and she did the right thing from a human perspective, and then she went home for Christmas. And her folks, who by now had caught wind of this, were very upset about it. Didn't want their daughter being a religious fanatic. They were concerned about how she would look to their friends, and they were concerned about where this might take her. And her dad came to her when she was home at Christmas, and he said to her, listen, you give up all this re religious fanatic stuff, uh, and you're, you're about to graduate from college. You give that up, I'll buy you your own house. I'll buy you a house. She took the house. Did she lose her salvation? No. She never had it. She just thought she did. 
She had good intentions. She did all the right things from a human perspective. But she traded in heaven for a house. So close. Yet so far. Beloved, all her dad's offer did was reveal what was deep inside the whole time. She had an idol. Do you have an idol? What's your idol? What is it that's keeping you from Jesus? There's nothing worth it. A hundred years from today, whatever it is, you'll wish it was Jesus. I pray it's Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this message. Thank you for your word. Thank you how time after time you make so clear that the claims you have are real, and then you certainly proved it. I don't have anybody else in my life that's died for me, but you did. I don't even know anybody else that's been raised from the dead, but you were. And everything in the Bible tells me that if I had been the only person in history, you would have done it for me. It's so personal. It would have been personal for this rich young ruler. And you loved him. But even your love was not enough to draw him to yourself. But Lord, I, there are those here this morning who your love can draw them to you. You know them by name. I pray this morning that as their heart is open, they will not say no, not another time, that they will say yes to you, that they will come confessing their sin, confessing themselves to be a sinner, confessing themselves dependent only on you for eternal life, thanking you that you lived the life they could not live and died the death they could not die to provide the life eternal in Jesus Christ. Thank you for that. Help us now as we sing together that this would be the invitation and the song of our heart and the prayer of our heart. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.